This episode brought to you by Avatar Braving the Elements, the podcast that gives you a deep dive look into the Avatar verse you can't get anywhere else. Also brought to you by Factor, America's number one ready to eat meal kit. Hey folks, we're starting YouTube memberships. If you want access to emojis, polls, behind the scene videos, and other perks, check out and see if you want to become a member. More perks coming soon. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember? Ha ha! We've done it. Oh, what now? By reviewing this movie. You opened up a parallel dimension. I've used all of my powers to create this. Uh, I think I'm good. What? Yeah, I'm reviewing Across the Spider-Verse, which is one of the most amazing films in years, and I really don't have time for the usual stuff. But we have like 20 lines here. Yes, this was going to be the episode where I reveal I masked that guy. There's just way too much to talk about with this movie. I really should just get to it. Fine. But there will be dire consequences. Dire. Dire consequences. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to reverse the footage of you coming in and... Yeah, Across the Spider-Verse! As you've heard me mention in the past, Into the Spider-Verse was easily my favorite Spider-Man movie. Yet, I never did a full-on review of it. Part of the reason is everyone has said pretty much what I think. It's fairly self-explanatory why this film is so great, and I don't really have a ton of new things to add on top of it. But with Across the Spider-Verse, there is so much visual stimulation, visual information, and visual storytelling going on that I'm convinced no one reviewer could cover all of it. It is overload how much this movie throws at you, which in many films would be a bad thing. But every small detail in the foreground, background, corner of the screen, or center of the screen all ties into either its clever humor or themes and ideas. I was blown away when I saw this movie, and despite seeing it several times, I'm still finding new things to notice on each viewing. To me, this is what the word Marvel was invented for, because this film is a cinematic Marvel. It's my new favorite Spider-Man flick, and I'm gonna dive into why. So let's not waste any time. Not even... a little bit of time? You need to go. Dick. Let's take a look at Across the Spider-Verse. First off, I love that even the opening logos has to utilize like 50 different art styles. Hell, even that little cough text before the logos is pretty artistically pleasing to look at. Like if you put that on a billboard and put soda under it, I'd buy that soda. The movie hasn't even started yet, and already I love its style. And we open with Gwen from the last movie playing the drums. His name is Miles Morales. He was bitten by a radioactive spider. It wasn't until I watched it back the fifth time that I realized while this is technically animation from the last film, it's done in the style of Gwen's world, using these melting watercolors and colder palette. I didn't want to hurt him. But I did. Even just the way it captures a person's mindset while making music. Thinking about the past, present, and future while the beat seems to create abstract but also distinct imagery is such a clever way to do both a recap and foreshadow of what's to come. And you're gonna hear me say this a lot, but pause the movie at random moments and just appreciate the layout. A lot of this flies by in literally milliseconds, but because of that you feel the effort and artistry snuck in on both a conscious level and subconscious level. I can't think of any other movie I can just randomly pause and be blown away by what I'm looking at. Oh, it turns out she's drumming for a band that points out she's really just drumming for herself. And yeah, if I point out all the Easter eggs, we're gonna be here forever. And she ends up quitting. As she goes home, we get an amazing mix of both verbal and visual narration as we understand both through the dialogue and imagery what's going on in her head. In this line of work, you always wind up a solo act. You ever go somewhere when your mind is racing with a million thoughts and you see the real world but also all your dilemmas surrounding you? That's what this is doing. Spider-Woman, Miles, Peter, her dad, all these images flash in the background as time seems distorted, just fading from one location to the next. Some things are very clear, other things are very fuzzy. There's a lot of detail, but it goes by too fast for you to focus too much on it. It's also a cool touch that this art style is also mimicking the Spider-Gwen art style from the comics. As you probably guessed, it looks spectacular. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry I'm kind of low on jokes right now. I just still can't believe I live in a World War movie this consistently amazing exists. No, 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 no. What did you do? I just wanted to be special. Like you. 
This version of Peter, I don't even think has five lines, but I am torn apart watching him die in Gwen's arms, and we don't even see her face through it. Gwen. Gwen? Don't worry. Who's Gwen? It's secretly sneaking in that much emotion in literally seconds without you even being aware of it. You hear that, exposition dump movies? You don't need to just bad ADR your plot points. Goddamn, make us feel what's going on instead of just telling us. Peter Parker is my daughter's best friend. And I will not rest until I find this spider woman. Slight conflict of interest, but hey, comic book movies. I think you could literally have a comic book character call the conflict of interest. She killed your friend. You don't know that. I don't want to argue about this. Yeah, I can tell. This movie is doing what Ang Lee's Hulk was trying to do, where it has the layout of a comic book to display the heightened placement of people's emotions. Like, why just have a close-up here when you can have a close-up and a wide shot seeing both their reactions? In fact, I kind of like the father is further away, like he's more behind in information, but then she goes back to hug him, like she's taking a step backwards from her world to be with him. See, that's the difference between this and Ang Lee's Hulk, because Ang Lee's Hulk is... <laughs> Ang Lee's Hulk. This has much more of an understanding about why certain visuals are emphasized in comic books. Ah, the reason this wasn't shown in the UAE. Take that country, not seeing one of the greatest cinematic achievements in years. Feel free to black Citizen Kane if young Charles looks a little too much like a girl at any point. You won't be missing anything important. I am the vulture, the pinnacle of man's genius. Someone breaks into the Guggenheim Museum and it turns out it's a version of Vulture from a Renaissance art dimension. Where are you from, bud? I am an artist, an engineer. This is so detailed, there's even notes scribbled around in the same way Da Vinci would scribble notes on his work. Also, I gotta respect a film that thinks Jeff Koons is overrated. Ah! But other spider folks start coming through the portals with music that, I don't know about you, but I just cream my jeans whenever I hear. Do me! And we're introduced to Miguel O'Hara and Jessica Drew. Did I mention, by the way, on top of this movie being a visual masterpiece, it's also funny as hell. Maybe you could stop making a mess of the art museum for no reason? You call this art! We're talking about it, aren't we? I mean, it's no. Hi, Hunch. God damn these movies. I mean, I like them, but we could've been getting these! It's pretty cool how Gwen uses the rhythm of her music with the rhythm of saving lives, as shown by the propellers next to her spinning her drumstick. Thus, Vulture is defeated, but Gwen's father discovers the truth. I didn't have a how choice. How long have you been lying to me? I love how they change up the background during this talk with every edit back and forth. Like both their worlds are melting into something sad and unpredictable. I adore anime movies where the backgrounds give you half the emotions. And once again, all these look like panels out of a breathtaking graphic novel. You have the right Dad, to return. Stop! Don't get any close. Jessica and Miguel save her though, and invite Gwen to join their legion of spider peeps. As it looks like her world here is destroyed. That was all just before the opening credits, and this is the page of notes that I took. Nah, nah, I'm just kidding. It actually went on to the next page. I stopped here. This movie's too good! We cut to Miles Morales, who's supposed to be talking with his parents and counselor about future colleges, but he's too busy stopping a pathetic villain named The Spot. A villain Miles is so not intimidated by, he literally heats up a snack before fighting him. You understand this is the fight of our lives, sorry, right? Sorry, sorry, just, okay. just a second. No, 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 go ahead, take the call. As you may have guessed, the action in this movie is pretty amazing. And again, a big part of that is the animation style. As I mentioned in my Puss in Boots 2 review, the skipping of frames allows you to see more of a clear picture so you can take in more visual information. I got you right where I am. On top of that, unlike a lot of CGI films, this movie has a real respect for the drawn line. Don't get me wrong, 3D animation is amazing, but 9 out of 10 times it's trying to look relatively real. Just some things about it are more exaggerated. Like is this CGI or live action? Could be either, right? With hand-drawn animation, you're taking the most important part of something, all the complex shapes of reality, and reducing it down to its simplest form, a line. Hell, even a line is basically just a dot stretched out. That's one of the reasons I don't mind rotoscoping so much when it comes to hand-drawn. How much of a human being in both form and movement can you capture with just a simple line and still recognize it as alive? That's amazing to me. When CG often tries to mix with line work though, it either just moves around one drawing like a puppet or it just puts a solid line over a CG model. 
It doesn't usually feel live, isn't that artistically pleasing to look at, and just doesn't have the same effect as hand-drawn. The lines in this movie, though, despite it being CG, do emphasize the most important parts of a character's form and movement. And on top of that, they also have beautiful shades of color in them, like a beautifully drawn comic book. This and its predecessor have a masterful understanding about why the drawn line is so important, and a brilliant technique about how to combine it with CGI. It. Ah, it also, I know I said I wouldn't point them all out, but I just noticed they go from a sudsy car wash to a coffee shop literally called Foam Party. Not an amazing joke, but somebody thought of it. I wanted them to know. I see you. It's better than this one, considering he clearly should have been playing this version. Come back to your nemesis! Don't escape! He stops the spot for now and shows up to the meeting. Can't have your cake and eat it too. Unless you bake two cakes. I actually bring up two cakes quite a few times in this. Did you order the cake for tonight? It won't fit on one cake. Come again. Did you even see the cakes? See you later with a cake. I'm just calling it now. They're gonna do something with two cakes in the final one. That's way too good a metaphor. I don't care if you had to fight two cakes in the climax. You gotta do something with this. Princeton University. That is too far. New Jersey's too far from New York. Some say the scenes with the folks goes on a little too long, but A, it does show the movie can slow down and pace itself. It doesn't always have to throw a million things at you all the time. And B, I like how much it foreshadows what Miles is about to go through. He never lets anyone tell him that he doesn't belong there. The speech with his mom saying don't let anyone treat you like an outcast is not only great because he's a unique student, but it also hints that even in a world filled with unwanted anomalies, he'll still be an unwanted anomaly. And he can still utilize that as a strength, not as a weakness. Ow, that hurt my tailbone. Are you kidding me? The spot escapes though, and this time both him and his father try to stop him. You left in the middle of a fight! I did not! It was Are you serious? Serious? It was inconsiderate and super rude! Again, slow these scenes down and see how amazingly put together they are. These are like Jackie Chan fights in animation. You just have to watch it closely to see both how creative and hilarious they are. He's barely a villain of the week! What'd you call me? Want to see the one edit I don't like in the movie? Come on, man! Everything! Ah! That reaction was so quick, it was actually kind of distracting. How many frames even was that? Even for this film, that's too few. I'm not nitpicking this to point out how bad it is. I'm nitpicking this to point out how perfect the rest of the 99% of this movie is. That's the one bad edit I could find in the entire movie, and it's only a few frames. Even when I try to insult this movie, I end up complimenting it. The spot finally reveals his backstory, saying he was affected by the Kingpin's dimensional ray in the previous film. Also, he was the bagel guy. You hit me with a bagel! At first I didn't like this because I thought the joke was funnier as a standalone joke. I didn't need it expanded on. But two things changed my mind. One, he's all about making holes. I like the fact that the guy hit with the bagel is all about making holes. In fact, I'm kind of wondering if he has anything to do with this parallel dimension too. Second, this means he literally started out as a joke to everybody. The whole film he wants to be taken seriously, but everyone sees him as a villain of the week. And honestly, he should be. Who the hell wants to see this guy as the main villain? We'll get to that in a bit, though, as Spot accidentally falls into himself, literally kicking his own ass, finding that doing so can also allow him to pretty much go anywhere, including different worlds. Have we mentioned the one edit in the movie I didn't think worked? Here's the one joke in the movie I didn't think worked. I am literally splitting the fabric of space and time. You're acting like weird stuff like this happens to you all the time. It's not even that long, but with this film's incredibly fast pacing, it feels like an eternity. Honestly, I'd be more down for... Hey, not sure how I got here. Has something to do with Spider-Man, I think. Intriguing. Yeah, that's something a normal person would say here. One of the universes is a Lego universe. Obviously a nod to the producer's earlier works. If you don't believe me, the person who animated it is actually a kid who did a Lego version of the Across the Spider-Verse trailer and they liked it so much, they actually hired him to animate this scene. Well, Lord and Miller, here's me in a Spider-Man outfit. I gladly accept your invite to be in the next one. Gwen appears catching up with one of the only people she considers a friend. Even though Miles clearly sees her as more of a friend. Missed you too. That is until I saw you in the suit and now I want nothing to do with you. She tells him about the Spider-Verse that looks after all the other dimensions with spider people in it. But really she's looking to see if there's any leads on catching the spot, as his abilities are allowing him to figure out how to jump to other dimensions. Maybe some things are supposed to be just for us. It's pretty hard to do a romantic Spider-Man scene as visually iconic as the Upside Down Kiss. But this one's pretty damn close. And again, it does have better lines than... I think I have a superhero stalker. Ah, oh, remember they're good movies. Remember they're good movies. In every other universe, Gwen Stacy falls for Spider-Man. Yeah, we know. 
This of course plus a complication in their relationship, and it doesn't help that the other arachnids aren't for it either. He can't be part of this. I... I'll never see him again. Goodbye, Miles. Whatever our Spider-Man spin-off may bring, we know it can always be worse. You remember watching Avatar The Last Airbender with all your favorite characters, Aang, Katara, Sokka, Zuko? Honor, honor, honor. Avatar has created quite a journey for a lot of people, I know it certainly has for me. And whether you're a long-time bender or new to the world of Avatar, jump into the epic world of Avatar with Avatar Braving the Elements, Nickelodeon's official companion podcast to Avatar The Last Airbender. Each week you can join hosts like the legendary Janet Varney, the voice of Korra, and the man himself, Dante Bosco, the voice of Zuko. Don't be all mean beans, boy! Yeah, that was a weird episode of Avatar. Join them as they rewatch every episode of The Last Airbender. They're joined by special guests like the cast, superfans, and even the creators of Avatar, Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitzko. They take a deep dive and behind the scenes look into the Avatarverse that you can't get anywhere else. So watch Avatar Braving the Elements because, quite frankly, I feel like I owe somebody. But also because it gives you insight into one of the greatest shows ever made. Listen to Avatar Braving the Elements on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And say, you know what? These people need to eat. Factor can handle that. Except, you know, it's probably not professional to combine these sponsorships this way, so I like food. Me, the guy reading the sponsorship right now. Yeah, you're not gonna see me much. I didn't work hard on the shot. But seriously, Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals makes eating better every day easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy! That's right, we said more back-to-back -back in two sentences. I, I, if I was writing this, I would have re-edited that. With over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. And look, I, I'm, I'm dropping the script. That shows how, how real this is. I didn't even like adjust the exposure. You can tell I'm like already, I, I kind of look like Casper the Ghost already, but now the exposure's making it. I'm doing this to let you know, like, these are really, really good. I have them quite often, and they really, really taste good. They take very little time to make, only like two minutes. Oh, cutting back to footage. I must have needed to put an edit there. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and it's easy to upscale and change things up whenever you need to. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing six to eight meals per week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. No prep, no mess meals. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. So there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed. Okay, deal time. Head to factormeals.com slash nostalgia50 and use the code nostalgia50 to get 50% off. That's nostalgia50 at factormeals.com slash nostalgia50 to get 50% off. Man, is that really, really bright? Oh my god, I, I have nothing for the ending. Hey folks, I'll be playing Final Fantasy VII every Friday on Twitch. I've never played a Final Fantasy game before, so I'm excited to see what they're like. Hope to see you there. Miles follows Gwen into the portal and we're transported to a dimension where Spider-Man is Indian. Like the previous film, this movie is very good at getting us familiar with the other Spider-Mans and making us instantly like them. This is where the traffic is, this is where the traffic is, this is also where the traffic is, there's traffic here too, and this is where the British stole all of our stuff! Oh, so it's like LA, except they steal all the British stuff. You made me feel empty, like I had a hole inside of me. We all have holes. Seriously, how are they making it so I can follow this action? I should be lost at thwip number three, but the layout is so good, it's like the world's fastest but clearest GPS for punches. We're introduced to Spider-Punk, who like punk itself, I almost hate, but then they just do those extra one or two things that make him so goddamn badass. I hate the AM, I hate the PM, I hate labels. I'm not a hero because calling yourself a hero makes you a self-apologizing narcissistic autocrat. Also, damn it, I thought Spider-Man Noir was the world I wanted to see get its own movie, but that might have been dethroned. They won't after this. No! However, the spot levels up his powers even more, causing Miles to have a vision. Again, I know this is like the fifth time I've said this, but slow this shit down to see how much they're getting across without you even realizing it. It's like not only are there parallels for what's about to happen, but also showing the same way Miles should have been taken more seriously by his peers, Miles should have taken the spot more seriously too. And in fact, they are more connected than Miles originally thought. 
And the fact that both of them were affected by the same dimensional ray I don't think is on accident. It's almost like that's what allows them to break the rules of traditional storytelling as well as they do. What was that? Our future. After saving the city from a giant sinkhole, as well as saving the father of Indian Spider-Man's girlfriend, the other spiders show up to stop the world from crumbling, as a canon event has been disrupted. What's a canon event? Well, Miles is invited to Spider HQ and of course introduced to a ton of cameos. Video game guy. I love video games. Another video game guy. Are you, are you talking to me? See, 40 minutes ago, that's how you do it. He's reintroduced to Peter B. Parker, who's now a parent, and brought to Miguel. He's the leader of the spider troops, making sure events that are supposed to happen always happen. Like a person always getting bitten by a spider, showing up in a Spider-Verse movie even when some should CLEARLY be making three more seasons! And of course, having someone close to them die. If any of these are broken like Miguel did once, their whole world would crumble like his did. Miles, as you may have guessed, is supposed to watch his father die at the hands of the spot. If not for Uncle Ben, most of us wouldn't be here. With all the good we did, it wouldn't have been done. It is interesting asking the question, can Spider-Man still be Spider-Man without some sort of tragedy? Honestly, at first, I thought this was a major problem with the Holland movies, but they eventually worked a little backwards and balanced it out. Miles, of course, doesn't want his father to die, but Miguel says it's for the greater good. Please understand, you can't ask me not to save my father. I'm not asking. It also doesn't help that apparently Miles is already a bit of a non-canon event, as the spider that bit him is actually from another dimension called Earth-42, hence why the number 42 popped up so much in the previous film. It was never supposed to bite you! You're the original anomaly! I really like this because it shows the battle between people who obsess over things that are canon and others who just want to ignore it. We've all seen fans who shoot down a cool idea because it's not canon, but we've also seen writers ignore the canon completely, missing the idea of what a character is all about. With so many different versions and interpretations of Spider-Man over the years, this really is one of the most perfect characters to execute this with. Miles! Miles escapes and we have a fight scene that's just as funny as it is creative. Okay, Spider-Man Noir, Punk, and T-Rex definitely need their own movies. He escapes to the teleporter and convinces the person in charge to send him home, which is a little rushed, like he flirted with her a little bit and now she's a rebel? I don't know. And because Gwen pushes back and says Miguel might be wrong, he sends her back to her world as well. We are supposed to be the good guys. A staple said every day in Congress. This forces Gwen to finally confront her father. Arrest me! I can't. Why not? Because I quit. When? About halfway through your big speech. The movie's already over two hours, this is a good way to speed things up. Gwen realizes if she could alter her father's death, maybe Miles could alter his father's too. But Miles quickly realizes he's in the wrong dimension, as his uncle is still alive, his father is dead, and there's another Miles who never got bitten and turned out to be the Prowler because of it. That's right, the machine sent him back to the world of Earth-42 because that's the DNA the spider that bit him left in his blood. Trust me, I know you don't want to be the Prowler. Okay, so I'm not gonna lie. I thought he punched Miles' brains all over the room. Nice knowing you. He just punched above him though, and as the spider posse searches for Miles, Gwen builds a team from the previous movie, and the spot vows to get his revenge by killing Miles' dad. An amazing cliffhanger leaving Miles helpless. Except I guess he's not. Okay, admittedly this is a weird place to end it, like, How will Batman get out of it? Probably the Batarang! But maybe not, but probably the Batarang. Still, it's an nitpick, and yeah, I think it's clear the father probably won't die in the next one, and that Miles will find a workaround while also showing Spot the two of them are similar. That's my personal guess. But whether I'm right or wrong on that, I just saw one of the most amazing movies I've seen in years. It's rare I use this term, but it is insultingly good. It's a movie that makes me ask in a field where films are incredibly hard to make and get funded and make financers and audiences and the director happy, why can't more of them be this good? I know it sounds like an oxymoron and it is, but the film kind of is too. You know those shows that have like amazing intros, like some of the most epic animation and visual storytelling and when the show actually starts, the quality drops a great deal. 
This film is like that intro lasted two and a half hours. You could watch it a million times and still miss an amazing detail, a phenomenal image, another layer to the story and characters that makes them work on even more levels. It is so in your face and bombastic that it's actually easy to miss all the subtlety slipped in that deserve just as much attention. At a time when a lot of people say not only superhero movies but film in general is missing the excitement, cleverness, and passion to thrill people, I say in all seriousness, the future of cinema is in the Spider-Verse. And yeah, sorry I couldn't do more of the crazy stuff like I usually do around here. There really was just too much to talk about. You will be sorry. Yeah, for we've had our devil friend here enact a curse on the studio. No one can enter. We're gonna make sure that none of you ever go in there ever again. You know, I think I'm okay with it. What? We've been acting shady ever since the tornado hit the studio. It took forever to get the damages from the tornado fixed. I'm not even 100% convinced they're fixed. This literally happened this week just from rain. Well, you know, ants. I think I'm good moving somewhere else. You don't even have another studio. Yeah, and it'll take some time to find a new one, but I think it'll be worth it to get away from you all. Huh. Could it be that our couple's counselor is right, and our need to push people away is actually pushing people away? I don't know. As our couple's counselor, what do you think? Nah. Nah. You will rue this day, critic. Rue. 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 Well, it looks like we'll be filming at home for a little bit, as is the theme for the past couple years. You hear that, Chaplin? I'm gonna be filming back at the house for a while. Did you ever leave? Very funny. What is? I'm a nostalgia critic guy, remember? So you don't have to. You call this art. We're talking about it, aren't we? This month for Cameos for Charity, we're doing the Center for Victims of Torture. I've done this charity a couple times and there's a reason. I literally cannot think of anything worse. We've used the word torture as a way to emphasize things we don't like to go through, but these are people that have literally gone through the worst things you can imagine. This center heals victims of torture through personal care worldwide, strengthens partners who heal torture survivors, and advocate for the protection and care of torture survivors. Heavy stuff I know, but you can help out. If you want a cameo of me saying happy birthday or good luck or whatever, click on the link below and be giving to a good cause. If you're like, nah, you suck, consider checking out this charity anyway. They're wonderful people doing wonderful work, and you can play a big part in helping with the healing.